The 228 incident took place on February 28, 1947, and is a dark stain on the history of Taiwan. Also known as the February 28th Massacre, it occurred during the closing days of World War II. When Japan ceded control of Taiwan to China, a move initially met with enthusiasm by a Taiwanese public, but that enthusiasm quickly turned to disdain when an occupying Chinese force proved inexperienced, corrupt, and cruel. The incident began when a dispute between a group of Chinese soldiers and a local cigarette vendor resulted in shots being fired into a large angry crowd, sparking a violent Taiwanese anti-government uprising, which was met with the retaliation of China's brutal National Revolutionary Army. You can still find footage of the massacre that followed online, but a lot of it's disturbing enough that I don't want to show it here. But the general attitude of China's soldiers towards the Taiwanese people can be summed up with a single quote from Kei Yun-Fen, the chief of the KMT secret police, in which he stated, We would rather kill 99 innocent good people by mistake than miss a guilty one. This was the ethos that led to an era of martial law in Taiwan that lasted 38 years, a period the Taiwanese have dubbed the White terror, during which paranoia and fear ran rampant. Any slight or even perceived infraction against the Chinese government could lead to entire families disappearing, and those infractions could be as minor as reading censored material or in one case, translating a Popeye comic. According to official numbers kept by the Republic of China at the time, 190 people were killed by Chinese forces during the White Terror. But examination of census data by Taiwanese scholars shows that figure at closer to 20,000. Of course, I'm not a historian. I am a ridiculous human being who talks about anime, games, and wrestling for a living. So the only reason I know anything about the 228 incident, the White Terror, or Taiwan in general is because these were the setting for one of my favorite games of 2017, the indie horror Detention from Taiwanese studio Red Candle Games. The story of Detention was inspired by the grandparents of some of the team members at Red Candle Games, who had actually lived through the White Terror. Those experiences of paranoia and oppression, the feeling of always being watched and never knowing when a classmate or teacher might just disappear, those are the experiences that the team at Red Candle crafted into a beautiful and nuanced piece of horror. The game itself was designed to look like an old faded photograph, capturing the feeling of that era perfectly and drew on Taiwanese and Asian mythology in order to flesh out the more supernatural portions of its story, creating a distinctive cultural identity for detention all while showing the damage high-level government oppression can have on the most vulnerable members of society, but also a chilling tale about one person's inability to accept the atrocities they've committed. Detention to me is horror at its most powerful, filled with cathartic creative scares, but using that fear to convey the very real terror the people of Taiwan would have felt and in doing so, turning the horror of detention into a tool for empathy, letting us experience the lives and traumas of people who grew up in a very different culture than we did. Detention was Red Candle's first game, and given how distinctly frightening it was, I was keen to see what the studio would do next. And whatever I might have expected, I never could have anticipated. Devotion. Like Detention, Devotion draws on the history and culture of its developers to create a distinctive and chilling kind of horror. But unlike Detention, the game takes place entirely from first person, with Red Candle using this perspective to create scares not possible in 2D, but also as a way to convey the feeling of having a surreal, lucid nightmare, using a single unbroken first-person camera shot to take us through its entire story, as we swim through the different memories and life events of its characters.
The first scene of the game sees us take the viewpoint of Du Feng Yu, father and husband to a family of three. And we're given a few moments just to soak in the cozy atmosphere of his warm family life until his hands begin to tremble and his vision blurs. And we awaken in the same apartments, now filthy and abandoned, leaving us with the question, what exactly happened to the Du family? From here, we're given the freedom to explore the Do's apartments, but this only raises some more unsettling questions. Why is Feng Yu's head out of frame in the family portrait? Why is the bathroom door always locked? And who is the woman who seems to be stalking us? Devotion asks these questions with strong, unsettling imagery, and it's the intrigue of those mysteries that pulls us through the game's opening scenes as we explore the environment and try to piece together what's happening. And look, I know, uncovering a mystery through environmental exploration is not exactly a new concept in 2019, but Devotion's strength is both in the quality of its environments as well as the story that's been built into them. Devotion's early scenes have the feeling of wandering around inside an old family photograph. And part of that is just how exceptionally crafted these environments are, with even little details like sweet packets, modeled and textured with an authentically Taiwanese feel, giving Devotion spaces a legitimate sense of place and culture. And I love this. If you've been watching my videos for any length of time, you'll know what a fool I am for some good, strong environmental storytelling. To me, there's no more interesting way to breathe life into a fictional character than to have that character reflected in the environment around them. And it's this kind of intimate world building that Devotion does so beautifully. There's a scene early on when you enter the Do's apartment on the day they first move in, and you're tasked with decorating the empty rooms with the Do's different crockery and memorabilia. But as you do, the apartment itself begins to transform, going from an empty set of rooms to something that feels like an actual home. And as it does, it reveals all these little insights into who these people are. For example, we find out that Li Fong, the mother of the Doos, used to be a famous singer and actress, and has left the spotlight to become a full-time wife and mother. But one look at her bedroom wall, and it's apparent how much her time as a star meant to her, and how reluctant she is to leave it behind. Likewise, Feng Yu's trophy cabinet shows the pride he takes in his career as a screenwriter, while the scripts themselves reveal how much he values being the father of a traditional family unit surrounded by his adoring wife and daughter. Letting us experience this moment through the eyes of the Doos establishes a kind of familiarity between us and them. After this sequence, the Doos felt like neighbors to me, people I might not have had any real relationship with, but of who I had had all these little glimpses into their lives. Another great example being a sequence when Feng Yu reads his daughter Mei Xin a storybook, and the game turns into a puzzle platformer as Mei Xin draws in her own parts of the story. And it's little moments like this that really creates the sense of the Doos as a family who were at one point really happy. And it's that feeling that makes the later events of devotion so horrifying. Creating a kind of fear that waypoints Daniel Riendo aptly termed as domestic horror. The best way to think about domestic horror is like this. If cosmic horror is fear of some gargantuan unknowable entity potentially residing in the deepest reaches of space, domestic horror is the opposite. It's the fear of the familiar, the person you wake up beside, the family and home that surround you, the idea that there could be some deep unknowable madness or evil residing behind the faces of the ones we love. And this is the horror of devotion. Our first real indication that something is not quite right with the Do family 
starts with the Du's daughter, Mei Xin. From an early age, it was decided that Mei Xin would become a singer, just like her mother, with an old rerun of her performing constantly repeating on the Du's television. But it soon becomes apparent the pressure that Mei Xin is under. The game using its first person perspective to show how the weight of her parents' expectation is crushing the little girl. There's one moment later on when we enter the apartment only to see another clip of Mei Xin performing in a singing competition, but this time it's Mei Xin losing the contest by a single point. And when the announcer reads out her results, the television starts skipping and repeating. <laughs> This moment is creepy, but it also captures how traumatic the contest was for Mei Xin, destroying her confidence and causing her intense performance anxiety that her parents end up mistaking as a physical illness. It's from the viewpoint of Mei Xin we start to see a more unsettling side to the Du family. We see through her eyes while she suffers a panic attack as her parents scream and argue in the next room. We watch her father through cracks in the wall as he begins to become more violent and unstable. At this point in the game, Feng Yu's career has started to crumble, the stress of his daughter's illness causing his scripts to become bloated with overly sentimental depictions of the serene family life he used to have, resulting in film studios no longer wishing to work with him. This puts tremendous strain on his relationship with Li Fong, with us overhearing a letter being read out on a radio show that sounds very much like Li Fong complaining about her husband's inability to provide. At this point in the story, we know how much family means to Feng Yu, and the pain and humiliation he would have felt in this moment is palpable. And it really frames the character as a man losing control of his life his beloved family now cracking apart. But it's in those cracks that a more insidious force begins to seep into the lives of the Du family. Early on, when Mei Xin first gets sick, Feng Yu is contacted by mentor Hu, a mysterious woman who lives upstairs from the family, claiming she can heal Mei Xin through spiritual healing as long as the family is willing to show her enough devotion. And so Feng Yu, on the verge of losing everything, begins to believe that Mentor Hu and her god Sigyu Gyuin are he and his family's only remaining path to salvation. And slowly, he begins to lose touch with reality. Devotion depicts Feng Yu's descent into madness with strong, unsettling imagery, but it's that imagery juxtaposed against the Du's once picturesque family life that makes the experience so unsettling. What should be comforting scenes of a loving family are given an eerie, uncanny quality when depicted with grotesque, mannequin like dolls that start to follow you unseen from room to room. With the apartment itself beginning to crack and distort as it stretches to impossible dimensions, it's through the apartments that devotion conveys the nightmare that the Du's lives have become. Over the course of the game, we're presented with the Du's home at three different times, 1980, 1985, and 1986. And the further down the timeline we go, the more manifestations of Feng Yu's madness begin to appear, with him eventually turning the apartment into a twisted altar to his god, and it starts to become apparent that his family may no longer be safe with him. And that's about as far as I can go without straight up spoiling the game, which I am about to do. So skip to here if you want to avoid, you... you cowards. As Feng Yu becomes an irreconcilable devotee to Sigyu Gyuin, Li Fang grows exhausted with the situation and leaves her husband, returning to her career as an actor, meaning that Mei Xin is now alone with her unstable father. The deterioration of her family, meaning her panic disorder, has become increasingly debilitating. 
But Feng Yu doesn't understand this. He doesn't want to believe that there could be anything mentally or emotionally wrong with his daughter and becomes convinced that she can only be healed through spiritual medicine. And so, out of genuine love for Mei Xin, brings her to the cult of Sigyu Yuin, in which mentor Hugh instructs him that the only way to save his daughter is to submerge the little girl in a spiritual wine for seven days, leading to Feng Yu drowning his daughter in the bathtub of their apartments in a misguided attempt to save her. The final moments of the game reveal Feng Yu sitting in front of the same static television we originally woke up in front of, the apartments now abandoned, his family gone, Feng Yu trapped in the endless cycle of reliving the memories that led to him killing his daughter. There is a scene towards the end of the game where you enter Mentor Hugh's apartments. You find all these answering machine tapes, and when you listen to them back, it's all these different people dissatisfied and irate that her spiritual healing isn't working. These people having been manipulated just like the dues were. And there's just this awful realization of like, shit, everything this family went through, all the pain and horror, it was all caused by this one low-grade con artist. Devotion is a story about how cults harm people, and when I originally discovered this, I was surprised because it seems like such a general concept, especially considering how specifically Taiwanese the inspirations for detention were. Or at least that's what I thought until I did a little research. What you're seeing here is a gathering of the Rula Yi Zong, a Taiwanese religious group with approximately 80,000 members, who have been repeatedly accused of financial corruption and breeding idolic levels of worship in their devotees towards the group's leader, a former stuntman who goes by the title Mio Chan. Mio Chan, meaning literally the wonderful Zen, claims to be a living Buddha, capable of healing healing sickness and dispelling negative karma from his followers. Those followers attributing every positive occurrence in their life to him, even believing he can protect them from natural disasters. The Rula Izong have been accused of drawing in the most marginalized members of society and manipulating them into donating large sums of their living wage every month, all operating with zero financial transparency. One of the most troubling parts about the Rula Izong is that it isn't even the only organization in Taiwan like this. Groups like this are so common that I've seen Taiwan described as an island of cults. And the reason for that is that after the oppression of the White Terror, Taiwan adopted very lax policies towards self-expression and especially towards religion allowing organizations like the Rula Izong to operate in plain sight, preying on the most vulnerable members of society. This is why the horror of devotion feels so real, because it is. Devotion draws on something frightening and terrible, but also something happening in Taiwan right now, right this second and uses it to tell a chilling story of how pouring all of who you are into one belief system or way of thinking will leave you with nothing. And to me, today, when atrocities are being committed on a nearly weekly basis in the name of a variety of different causes, Devotion's message is a powerful one. I think this is a story that people need to hear. Which is where I'd like to end this video, but I can't. Felt like we came to a nice emotional conclusion there, but for all I've said about devotion, you can't actually buy this game. Devotion had an extremely successful launch earlier this year, quickly becoming a smash hit on Twitch with thousands of reviews on Steam, placing the game in the overwhelmingly positive category. But all that came to a halt when the text Xi Jinping Winnie the Pooh Moron 
was found in one of the game's art assets. Xi Jinping being the president of China, but also the subject of a popular internet meme likening him to Winnie the Pooh. A comparison that he apparently takes such umbrage with that Winnie the Pooh was censored out of the Kingdom Hearts 3 promotional material, as well as the movie Christopher Robin being denied release in China, which is a shame because that movie is a delight. The inclusion of the meme in Devotion was taken with extreme ire by a portion of Chinese players, leading to a very negative backlash against the games of Red Candle, with both Detention and Devotion being revealed you bombed on Steam, with Red Candle eventually removing devotion from the store entirely. I don't think that hidden messages like this are the best way to criticize an oppressive regime, especially from a studio that has already very successfully criticized oppressive regimes, but I also think that Xi Jinping with his policies on censorship and restrictive views on human rights is a leader worthy of criticism. According to a statement released by Red Candle, the art asset itself was just a placeholder and never meant to be included in the final release. But intentional or not, it has led to a very complicated situation, with many Chinese players being less offended by the meme and more concerned that its inclusion could lead to increased regulation on video games in China, with the matter growing ever more complicated when taking into account that Valve are currently developing an exclusively Chinese version of Steam that will be subject to China's censorship laws. At the time of writing, it's unclear when or even if Devotion will be available again for purchase. And I think that's really unfortunate because I think this is a game that needs to be experienced by more people. I'm guessing not that many people are going to care about a mid-tier anime YouTuber talking about a PC indie horror game. But I also think what Red Candle has done with both Detention and Devotion is really special drawing on their own history and culture to tell stories of horror that are real and powerful. And if making this video leads to a few extra people checking out their games and supporting them, well, I'd be pretty happy with that. Friends, thank you for joining me today. Check out the description of the video for the current status on Devotion and I'll update it as soon as the game becomes available again. I want to thank you for watching this video and I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did and want to help me create more videos like it, then head on over to patreon.com forward slash super eyepatchwolf. Thank you to all my patrons who make this and every other video possible. And in particular, this video I'd like to thank Dino Rocket, Michael Orr, Akalorak, I'm so sorry, Akalorak, Leonard, C. Lee, Anne Wu, Donald Donahue III, and Suplex Badger. Come find me on twitch.tv forward slash super eyepatchwolf where I stream 5pm EST most Fridays, hosting the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast or on Twitter at eyepatchwolf. Friends, take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time.